Welcome to The Sword and the Trowel, a podcast of Founders Ministries. Founders Ministries exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of churches. I'm Jared Longshore. And I'm Tom Askell. Hey, we are grateful that you're listening to The Sword and the Trowel today. Very glad to have you with us. And uh, we want to let you know we're very excited about the Institute of Public Theology. Applications are now open. You can go to instituteofpublictheology.org and you can find out how to apply to attend the Institute. We're already getting some great feedback that a number of applications mm-hmm. have begun. And so jump on there and discover what it means to attend the Institute of Public Theology. I've I've received uh, a few questions from people asking about auditing courses, too, and that is going to be available. Uh, The application process for auditing courses will be released here in the next few weeks. So if you're interested in that, just pay attention. And and yes, it will be different than if you enroll fully uh, in the Institute. Yes, we have Just Thinking About the State, a book uh, written by Daryl Harrelson and Virgil Walker, our dear friends, published by Founders Press, and that is now available for pre-sale. So you can go to founders.org and uh, go ahead and order your copy of Just Thinking About the State. And and the pre-sales of that book has catapulted it to the number one spot on the bestseller list of The Sword and the Trial. Oh, there yeah. you go. So the number one bestseller thus far in our Sword and That's Trial. That's right. Did you hear uh, that, Virgil and Daryl? The number one bestseller <laughs> on the Sword and the Trial top hits. <laughs> I like that very much. Uh, let's see. Militant and Triumphant. That is our national conference. It's coming yeah. up in January. And we're delighted to announce that we have Conrad Mbewe, who will be speaking at that mm-hmm. conference. He's joining the list of you will be uh, preaching there. I'll be preaching. Vody Bacham will be as well. And so go ahead and, and mark others. that on your calendar. And others and others there's more in the works details so uh you can go to founders.org you can actually register for that conference now uh at a price that i believe is lower than if you do it later that's right yeah that's right that's going to be a great conference i mean we have um Last year we did, uh, or our last conference, we did the doctrine of God, which is just so foundational. We can't assume it anymore. Same thing's true with the church. We've got to understand the church is God's idea. And while we are here in this fallen world that, yeah, we are going to be the church militant. We are on the offensive. We're called to engage in life in such a way that the gates of hell are being stormed because Jesus has promised that they will not prevail against the work of the church that he's building. So what does it mean to be a militant church, not, uh, you know, that that language is offensive to some, but it comes straight from the Bible in terms of how we are to operate as Christians in spiritual warfare. And then the triumphant nature, you know, it's not going to fail. This, Mm -hmm. this project, this mission is going to be accomplished because Christ has done everything. The spirit is with us. We're not left to our own resources. So I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a great time together. Amen. Well, here's the question for today, Tom. Is critical race theory and intersectionality a distraction for Christians? We want to get into this question a little bit. Uh, We've obviously addressed this topic in a number of ways, uh, really from Resolution 9 of the Southern Baptist Convention is kind of what catapulted the language of critical race theory and intersectionality onto the evangelical scene. Uh, And yet it's uh, pervasive. It's been a national reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's still still seem to be some who may claim that addressing these vain philosophies, these uh, corrupt theories, would be a distraction, something yeah. that will, will get us away from the work that we're really to do as Christians. So is yeah. that true? No, it's not true. And, you know, we, we've discussed this multiple times. I mean, how did we, how did you and me, how did founders get in the situation that we're in today? Uh, well, we got here because we're trying to be faithful to what God's called us to do as pastors. I mean, it's trying to shepherd the flock of God, trying to take seriously what it means to equip the saints to do the work of ministry and recognizing that the book that God has given to us, the Bible, teaches us that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords, that he's Lord over everything. And so no subject is off limits. No sphere of life is off limits to having Christ speak into it because this is his world. And so as pastors, I mean, we've addressed, we've come to address these things because of pastoral ministry. And we try to encourage other pastors to think this way as well. So it's not like, uh, Hey man, you know, what do you want to What what do you want to find controversial today that we can talk about? It's just, this is the battle that has come to us. We didn't go out looking for this. This is what is going on in our world today. People are being destroyed 
by these ideologies today. Churches are being ripped apart. I, every week I hear of another church that has had massive upheaval because these ideologies have come in. I was in a conference not long ago and uh, talked to several people who were just, you know, with weeping, with tears, saying we're having to leave our church or our church has d- done this or our pastor's gone this way and we don't know what to do. And it, So these things, mm-hmm. they're in the world. And if we're going to be faithful shepherds, we're going to have to figure out what it means to refute these uh, wrong ideas, to take every thought captive and to bring everything under the Lordship of Christ, help our people to understand that. And so, yeah, I, it's not incidental. It is part and parcel of pastoral ministry. Yeah. Uh, we really did not go looking for it as pastors. We were shepherding the flock. I remember, I don't know how long ago now, but the Gospel Coalition had a women of color assembly yeah. at one of their conferences. And they very politely asked that uh, ladies who were not women of color, white ladies, very politely asked them not to come so Mm -hmm. that the space could be provided for the women of color. And right in our congregation, we have two ladies that were going to that (laughs) conference, uh, one of them with dark skin, one of them with light skin. And praise be to God that the one with dark skin said, I'm not going to this meeting if my sister in Christ can't come. What's the deal? We're going to this thing together. We're about to get on a plane. We're about to fly together to this conference or drive. And then, you know, and then I'm supposed to go in here and part ways with my um, sister in Christ because we're bringing back segregation. No. Uh, So pastoral ministry, we have to shepherd these people. We're going to have to help in intersectionality and critical race theory. We're absolutely undergirding what was going on there. Now, does that mean that um, the people that were attending that conference are advocates of a full throated critical race theory? I'm not claiming that, but you're going to tell me that those ideas don't have consequences and that those ideas are not bubbling up in disinviting uh, one color skin of women to the conference or to the particular meeting. Absolutely. It was. So I do think that there's going to be, um, more pressure on this idea that yeah. getting into these kinds of things is a distraction. We're great commission uh, people. We're gospel centered people. <laughs> yeah. And we're we not going to, yeah, we're, we're going to just kind of focus here on the church, particularly if you're in the Southern Baptist world. And if you're engaged in ministries that maybe focus a lot on ecclesiology and um, they think, well, you know, these things are getting away from really the duties that we are engaged in. That's not true. It's not right. going to work The very work you're trying to do as a pastor is going to be under cut by what's coming in. Yeah. And that, that's, I mean, we hear it all the time. I've, I've heard it again recently from those that are uh, leading uh, various efforts in the kingdom for church planting or international missions or uh, theological education or whatever. And it's like, you know, you guys are disrupting things. You guys are, are turning people's attention away from the main thing. Let's keep the main thing, the main thing. Well, amen. What's the main thing? We have marching orders as a church. We are to make disciples. We are to preach the gospel. But if there are ideologies in the world that are undermining the message of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, and beginning to add to it so that uh, it becomes less than the gospel, other than the gospel, well, then we don't want to just say, hey, let's just keep doing it. Let's just keep doing it. Let's just keep sending it out there. I mean, Galatians 1 is in the scripture. And we're to be fanatical about the purity of the gospel. If an angel or an apostle preaches something contrary to the simple gospel that the apostle Paul Mm -hmm. preached, then that angel, that apostle is to be damned to hell. Mm -hmm. That's the language that he uses there. So it, um, I don't know what it is. It's superficial. It's, uh, it's not thoughtful at all for them to say, no, 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 this is our mission. You're detracting from the mission by calling attention or talking about CRT intersectionality. No, these are ideologies that if they're not knocked in the head, if they're not refuted, if we don't silence the people that are trying to uh, either wittingly or unwittingly, now grant many of them probably unwittingly, but if we don't silence them, then we're, we're failing. We're defaulting our duty. We're derelict of duty, according to Titus chapter one of what elders in the church are called to do. We are to understand and to be able to refute by sound doctrine, these things that come in and take people captive and lead them astray. Uh, so I, I, it's, it's a matter of stewardship. I, I don't know else how it's to describe it. Yeah. And it's not that, um, the only things you are to rebuke are, um, clear cut, um, right up front rejections of orthodox doctrine, meaning uh, if somebody came and denied the deity of Christ, they'd say, well, yeah, I'll stand up for that and I'll, mm-hmm. I'll address that. That wouldn't be a distraction. Right. Uh, but somebody might say to you after what you just said, but you know, for these 
disinviting certain people from meetings or um, adopting some of these theories. They don't seem to be outright rejections of cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith. But that doesn't square even with how the Apostle Paul operated. Uh, Peter there (laughs) is um, eating with the Gentiles. A certain group of people show up. He begins to back up. And Paul rebukes him publicly in front of everyone because his his actions were not in step with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you begin to promote uh, the ideas of uh, Delgado and Crenshaw, you begin to advocate for these worldly philosophies of justice and equality. Yes, you are subverting what God has actually revealed about justice. And if you're touching upon that, you're touching upon uh, grace and justice. I've said uh, this before, but the the, the widespread demand for justice. We want justice. When do we want it now? According to an intersectional framework, uh, ends up being demanding grace. And if you're walking around demanding grace, I demand that I be treated better than I deserve. Well, you have subverted. You've subverted the very definition of grace, and therefore you're subverting the definition of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And justice Christ. as well. No, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, there is a standard. God's given it to us in his word. And if we're not operating on the basis of that standard, we're not trying to bring it to bear on these kind of conversations, then it's so easy to get manipulated. And we are seeing that, and it's grievous, it's heartbreaking to see ministry after ministry be led astray, either by advocating things that do ultimately undermine the message of the gospel, or by staying silent and therefore being complicit as the gospel is being undermined. And it's heartbreaking. I I, I, again, we just want to appeal, as we've done privately and publicly, want to appeal to pastors and and church leaders, look, uh, these things are genuine threats. And if we close our eyes and walk away, then our children and our children's children will be made far easier prey to these worldly ideologies than if we stand right now and we draw the line and we say, we're not backing off from this and we're willing to uh, go to our graves if necessary for the sake of the gospel. And goodness, that's why we believe what we believe today. I mean, God's used the wonderful martyrs of the faith throughout history who said, no, Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, I'm not going to say Caesar's Lord and no, I'm not going to go along with the Roman Catholic church. And I'm not going to say that the, because the Pope said it or councils have said it, that we have to believe it. No, this is what the word says. And sometimes I just wonder, especially Baptists, but not just Baptists, all of the evangelical movement. Do we even remember the Protestant reformation? Do we even remember the early church and what it cost for the gospel to be handed down from generation to generation without compromise. There was incredible cost in that. And if we're not willing to pay that cost today, or if we think that somehow that ours is a generation that gets skipped from that stewardship, then we just need to go back and read the Bible again. We need to pray and ask God to help us to see it and recognize that no, we stand on the shoulders of faithful men and women throughout generations. And if we love Christ, if we love the people coming after us, if we love the world in which we live now and want to see people come to Jesus Christ, we've got to be faithful with the message. Yeah. There, there is a qualification I would put. I do, I do think some um, may approach CRTI as a distraction. So while the, the clear cut answer to the question is it's not a distraction from faithful Christianity, faithful Christian living and faithful pastoring, it can be a distraction. Sure. It can become uh, where you're like a one trick pony. This is the right. one thing that you do. I, I, I exist uh, to, to d- eradicate critical race theory and intersectionality from right. the evangelical world. And it becomes all that you ever talk about, all that you ever write about, all that you ever think about. And uh, so that's a small qualification amid a broad answer of no, it's not a distraction for those of you who are engaged on this topic. Um, and, and I would say it's interesting. It, it can be a distraction by making the same mistake that I think some of the um, other guys, maybe like the healthy church guys that don't want to get into it at all and don't want to address it, think it's a distraction. Uh, the problem with that, problem with like maybe the healthy church, church centric folk that don't consider um, all of God's truth for all of all of life, they think, well, the Bible speaks to these church matters, but the Bible doesn't speak to these theories, these secular theories and political ideologies, um, any of that stuff. The Bible doesn't really Really address that stuff, or if it does, I don't understand the application. So I'm not going to touch it. Um, we're not going to address it. It's a distraction. I'm just going to preach God's word to my people, and I'm going to shepherd the flock. So that um, broken that 
broken and truncated view of the scriptures is a problem. And the guys that maybe OD on critical race theory and intersectionality, and that's all they can ever mm-hmm. think about, really make the same mistake. Right. They're not actually <clears throat> allowing the Bible to govern the way that they're addressing the issue. So it just becomes something that's merely political, and I can be some kind of hatchet person, or I can just address it uh, according to a residued conservatism that is disregarding what the scriptures actually say. Right. It's the same mistake. So we really do have to come and say Jesus Christ is is king of all, that he has authority on heaven and on earth, that his word applies to all of life. And critical race theory and intersectionality are um, two very much related theories that are being advanced in our day. There's no doubt about that. If you look to the Black Lives Matter riots with um, the George Floyd situation from last year, recently we talked about AC CSI, the Association mm-hmm. of Christian Schools International, partnering with Walter Strickland's organization, Unify Ed, with people within that organization right. advocating Kendi, I believe it was, right. um, the Resolution 9. Recently, I went down to uh, our very local Lee County school board, and it was remarkable that even here in Lee County, um, which is a fairly conservative area in Florida, in Southwest Florida, uh, they're having trainings given to the school board of Lee County on intersectionality, uh, LGBTQ competency and awareness is what they were calling it. And uh, there was a private training of the school board. And I want to show you one of these slides and read one of these slides. This um, I, I received, a, I believe it's a 63 slide PowerPoint presentation that was given by Lee County faculty to uh, or or staff to the lee county school board one of the slides is entitled intersectionality and the lgbtq plus community that's the title (laughs) it's got the rainbow flag uh, on it it's got the school district of lee county emblem up Mm -hmm. in the top right and this is what it says intersectionality is a way of approaching social change work that recognizes that systems of oppression and the communities affected by them overlap and that addressing inequity affecting one community can't happen in isolation Within this, we must consider the intersectional identities of LGBTQ plus and gender nonconforming youth of color and how to design interventions, programs, and policies that address their unique needs. Gosh, what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, here it is. So what do we, we, we have, you have people in your church that teach in the school system, and this is what the school board's being educated by. So what are we as pastors to do? Or we say, well, you know, man, just do the best you can out there, but we're going to just preach the gospel in the church and uh, we're going to make disciples. And no, I mean, we've we got to equip our people to stand for Jesus. And of course, this is nothing different than we're not shocked by the language. We've been talking about this for two years, been studying this for multiple years. And this is precisely what CRT and intersectionality do. Uh, you remember when Black Lives Matter, you know, man, they, they were the big thing last year in the middle of the uh, after the George Floyd incident and the riots that came Black Lives Matter was making hundreds of millions of dollars with corporate sponsors trying to to uh, do obedience to them and giving them money and they had their website and their website was so uh, pronounced and saying it's not enough to say Black Lives Matter you've got to say that lesbian lives matter and queer lives matter and, and L- the whole LGBTQ plus well as people began to say that or, or call attention to it, they finally took that down mm. because even they recognized it wasn't politically expedient. They had overplayed their hand to be so honest uh, up front. Now, they haven't changed their conviction. And, of course, this slide and that whole teaching effort reveals it. So if pastors are not going to think about these things and pastors are not going to address these things biblically, we're basically saying to our people, hey, just go out there and be slaughtered. You know, Go out there and be taken Captive. Yeah, I mean, if you lived in a school district in which your school board was being trained in the Quran, um, with probably them saying, well, we're not going to teach the kids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're yeah, just yeah, going to yeah. get trained in the ideology as the school board, right, who is the final authority um, of the whole entire school system in the county. We're being trained in this, but we're not going to advance it. Well, how would you think then as a Christian pastor? Right. Well, they're actually teaching what 95%, 90 to 95% of the rising generation of this land, these ideologies about justice and equality. Uh, regarding the connection with the Black Lives Matter and the, inter- and the um, LGBTQ community, two slides later, 
in this presentation. Um, there is another slide that says intersectionality in the LGBTQ plus community and about six bullet points there at the bottom of that slide is a rainbow flag with a black lives matter power fist right in the middle of it mm -hmm. you say well what's that about why why do we have um these pairing you go down a little bit further in the um in the powerpoint slide there's actually a picture of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. World War II, Nazi Germany, the whole, it's 62 slides about LGBTQ competency and awareness. And we are comparing uh, intersectionality, these kinds of ideologies and equality along the lines of the gender spectrum with the Holocaust, right. with Adolf Hitler. Right. This is being the trained <clears throat> right here in our schools. Uh, so if Christians aren't aren't aware, if you say, well, you know, this isn't really a big deal. If you pull like a David French and say, hey, you know, <laughs> QAnon is a bigger deal than what's going on. I don't think that the school board of our various counties throughout America are being trained in QAnon. That's right. Theory. And, and the Southern Baptist Convention has not adopted a motion say that, saying that QAnon is a useful analytical tool. And yet here's what David French did say. The main problem with CRT and evangelicals is the extent to which overhyped alarmism about evangelical quote wokeness is being used to close minds and hearts to necessary conversations about race in the church. Q and anti-vax beliefs are more prevalent in the church than CRT. Well, you know, again, we've already talked about it. there are some people and it's just like this is their whole existence is to address CRT intersectionality and that's all they focus on. That's not us. It's not what we would advocate for churches or pastors to do or Christians to do. But we sh we do advocate be people of the book think rightly. And whenever you're thinking rightly and you see these things coming in and you see people being taken captive by these horrific ideologies, mm -hmm. you can't say, well, the most loving thing to do is to use whatever pronouns that they want to use. The most loving thing to do is to tell this man who says he's a woman, it's okay to be a man. You can go in the woman's bath or be a woman. You can go in the woman's bathroom. You can compete in women's sports. That's not loving. Yeah. It's dishonoring to God. It, it denies the Lordship of Christ over that. And if you, if you're not addressing these things, helping your people to think through them again, you're setting them up to just be completely manipulated and put into untenable positions. We got to help our folks understand what does it mean to stand for Christ? How do you stand for Christ? And where do you recognize the battle lines? And, uh, I, these, these evangelical leaders that tell us, you know, that's just the world. That's the way it's going. We just need to stay in our church and make disciples. I want to ask, what does it mean? to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. What does that mean Absolutely. in discipleship? Absolutely. What does it mean to be a faithful pastor? I can tell you right now, if, if one of our um, cake bakers in our church is going to get pressed civilly for not baking a particular cake, we're going to be there Absolutely. to bear public witness to truth and justice and love. And what, what really bothers me is that uh, I believe we have a large amount of pastors who have been trained to not protect the sheep right. in that particular situation. Say, well, that's a civil deal and I'm not going to go get into it. If you have a teacher who, if I were to go on and show you more of this training, actually goes to case studies of a, of a quote, girl who goes to the authority of the school saying my professor, my teacher continues to refer to me by masculine pronouns when I've multiple times said that I want to be called by feminine pronouns, a biological male that's doing this. What would you do? How would you mm -hmm. deal with this? So you're mm -hmm. going to have people in your flock and administration who are going to get pressed to use the, uh, contrary pronouns to the student's biological sex. And what are you going to do? How are you going to help them to do that? You, as a pastor, you are supposed to be there to shepherd them as they're going through life and not have any truncated vision of that. And if you think that this is just something that's kind of uh, going to come and go, well, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not making any claim about the particular language of critical race theory and intersectionality, but the ideologies, the, the worldview is, is here to stay. One of the um, slides entitled new administration of this Lee County school board briefing actually deals with the executive order. It says executive order signed by president Biden on January 20th, 2021 
What does it say? Well, it enforces the Bostock decision. And looking at you, um, Judge Gorsuch, this, mm-hmm. is, this is very troubling that he was, had a hand in this. Enforcing the Bostock decision where the Supreme Court held that Title VII's prohibition on discrimination, quote, because of sex, unquote, covers discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. And so this is actually legal. It's coming down the pipe. And there, there's no way to to back away from it and not to have a biblical ethic about it, to not to understand how we're going to sh- um, shepherd the church through these various trials. Yeah, so it is, it's just part and parcel of pastoral ministry. I mean, this is a, this is a large part of the most recent impetus for us uh, trying to put together and now working the Institute of Public Theology. And we, we desperately need to have these conversations. We need to recover what it means to think about these things, to realize that, yes, the church has a lane, and the church should not try to uh, bring the civil magistrate under the authority of the church. That's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about the civil authorities have a, uh, a lane, the church has a lane, family has a lane, but you know what? Jesus owns all the lanes. Mm-hmm. And Jesus is the one who vests mm-hmm. his authority in every legitimate authority on earth because all authority in heaven and earth belong to him. And as we are faithful in our lane as shepherds of the church and the church is, is seeing its responsibility to go and make disciples in the world, that means that we say to the family, we say to the state, we say to everyone who we can get to, Jesus Christ is Lord, and you need to bow to Christ as Lord. And that means that as civil magistrates or school administrators or whatever, that you are going to be held accountable by the the God who created you, the Lord Jesus himself, and for you to do things that would uh, go against Christ is not going to go well for you. You are obligated to do your job in a way of what is right and not in a way of what is wrong based upon the God who created the world and the God who himself defines righteousness. Yeah. You and I tried to spell this out in our book, strong and courageous. We have a chapter there on teaching Kings and we consider uh, Psalm two. Now, therefore, O Kings be wise, be warned O rulers of the earth. Um, kiss the sun, lest you perish in the way. There is an authority uh, that Christ has over all of life, mm-hmm. surely over this Bostock decision, surely over President Joe Biden. And uh, we pray that our legislature and that our judges would be brought into conformity to that which Christ requires of them. And you actually have to be thinking that way. If you're going to um, do what you ought to do in fulfilling the great commission and, and then shepherding your flock faithfully. Um, You know, some, some people would say that CRTI is a distraction because um, we can kind of, you know, some people want to eat the meat and spit out the bones Mm -hmm. and that's fine. The, you know, if they want to eat the meat and spit out the bones, if they want to use it as an analytical tool, and not as a to- totalizing worldview, um, then go ahead. Uh, what do you say to somebody that says, hey, they're, they're, no Christians are really um, swallowing this hook, line, and sinker. They're just trying to uh, eat the meat and spit out the bones. Yeah, well, the, pr- the problem is you, you've got um, an ideology that has embedded in it uh, presuppositions that if you deny the presuppositions, then you no longer have the ideology. If you try to use the ideology, you have to imbibe the presuppositions. Uh, one of which is that racism is permanent Mm -hmm. and pervasive. So every situation has racialized dimensions to it. So you don't ask if racism is involved in the conversation or the event, you look for the ways that it is. Well, Okay, that's game over. If you buy that presupposition, well, then you are already setting yourself on a foundation that's other than Scripture because Scripture deals in reality. Scripture deals in right and wrongness. Scripture deals in the lordship of Christ over all, and he tells us what is sin and what is righteous. Mm -hmm. And if you have already rigged the game to say, oh, no, 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 everything is sinful, everything is racism in some degree or another, then give up the Bible. Yeah. So that's one. Yeah. That's one area that you can't just chew the meat, 
spit out the bones because the bones are inherent in this whole and there's a, there's a definition operating under there somewhere and a lot of that time that's going to be sublimated but you start to say mm-hmm. well if racism's universal what is it yep. uh, go ahead and tell me what it is and we we have a big problem with uh, disregarding ontology disregarding the very nature of things definitions uh, well you're going to find that crt advocates a radically different definition of racism than a uh, Christian would. And right. so Christian's going to develop that definition based on scripture and talk about this racial pride or racial malice and have a very clear um, definition of it. That's not going to be the same with CRT. Uh, similarly, one of the tenets of critical race theory, according to, to Delgado, you can get his PDF online. He's one of the critical race theorists, um, not a Christian from any understanding I have of him. But uh, one is that there is a competency that people of color have when it comes Mm -hmm. to talking about racism. Yeah. Well, okay, let's talk about it. Where does competency come from? Like, what is competency? Well, competency is the the man or woman, I don't care what color you are, that has a greater (laughs) apprehension of God's word and God's world. Mm-hmm. You understand uh, the God who is the creator. You understand him as redeemer. Uh, you have a sanctified mind that can come to the truth and that can uh, begin to apply that truth appropriately in sound wisdom. Mm-hmm. And that is not based on what color skin you have, right. or if you poke around more, even based on um, some kind of suffering you've experienced. That's right. Now, if you have suffered, then there is, there's a uniqueness to being able to tell, well, you know, I suffered in this way whether it was I was abused by my parents or I went on the mission field and was persecuted for Christ. There are sufferings, and we, we're very grateful to hear those kinds of stories. But it doesn't give you an actual competency to speak to a particular ethic just because you have walked through that. You could have experienced that suffering and not have that wisdom, not, exactly. not have that competency. So radically uh, different understandings of that subject as yeah. well. Yeah, and, and th- this is a fundamental thing, and we just need to bring it up and highlight it again and again. Reality is what God says is reality, Mm -hmm. not my lived experience, not my truth. No, God is the one who tells us what is true and what is real. And so, for example, the way this gets played out, an example in microaggressions, you know, we're told that we ought to be just very sympathetic with anybody who feels microaggressed by us. So I could say, you know, Jared, you know, the, the, that one song we sang yesterday in church, uh, uh, that really offended me when you selected that song and cause I wanted a different song and you, know, you sinned against me. I'm so sorry, Tom. I want um, everyone to have a place at the table when it comes to the selection of our music here at the church. And so if you have a recommendation, I'd be interested to hear it as long as it, you know, we're going to have a white song and then we're going to have a black song. And we're going to have a Hispanic Syri- song. Syrian song. I would make sure a Syrian song works it, its way into our rotation. See, it, and, and what you've just done, we, we just done here is you have crippled me. You've crippled me thinking you're being kind to me. You've been unloving to me thinking, and people would applaud you for how sensitive and loving and empathetic you are to me. And what you've done is you've hindered me because you haven't sinned against me. There's no sin involved in that. And if I'm taking offense over something that is not sinful, not unrighteous, well, why would you let me live that way? Why would you let me just go down that pathway? That is a horrible way to live. It's not living in reality. God defines what is righteous. God defines what is sinful. And whenever I accuse you of sin based on my lived experience, and it's not sinful according to God, yeah. man, you, and you put me on the wrong pathway. And to show how you, how you slide into this, you know, I think there'll be a lot of Christians that hear that, what we just did, and they say, okay, guys, well, I agree. It's not a, it's not a cardinal transgression not to play the Syrian song in your um, in your Sunday morning worship but guys wouldn't it be wouldn't it be kind wouldn't it be wouldn't it be loving if you knew that there was someone there who was per, from that particular ethical eth- ethnic background to play a song that would resonate with them and this is where there's a oh, well perhaps yeah maybe perhaps so. but the problem is what's going on pervasively all around us right now is a move away from a god-centeredness to a man-centeredness to to can you meet my particular needs can mm-hmm. you satisfy this particular desire and it's not just along lines of ethnicity along the lines of sex it's along all sorts of lines yep. and people are beginning to 
coddle that. Yeah. And so the, the only way, if you make that shift, if you actually do turn from a God word orientation to a strictly man word orientation, you're not going to bless anyone. You're not going to help them. You're going to lose it all. Everything's going to get inverted. Yep. You're going to start demanding, not justice, but start demanding grace. You're going to have things backward. You're going to totally get rid of a doctrine like total depravity. Right. You'll have no place whatsoever for unconditional election. You will certainly have no place for a particular redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will become some kind of, um, some kind of unjust being that he would not uh, treat every fallen creature in exactly the same way, that mm-hmm. he would not send his son to die for everybody in the same way and then leave it to man's free decision uh, whether he accepts what has, uh, what has been exacted there. You will not have any kind of reformed soteriology that could operate as you make the shift to that worldview. Yeah, and this highlights how what we said earlier, you know, that we're not going out looking for this fight or we're not saying, oh, this is the, the issue that we've got to give our lives to. No, we're trying to understand how to live in God's world based upon the word that he's given to us. And so if I am that guy who says, well, because you're not singing Syrian songs, I'm just going to go somewhere else, you know, and okay, well, is, is the gospel being preached? Is Christ being honored as Lord? Is the church uh, practicing the ordinances and discipline? And if I'm leaving because there's no Syrian songs, that's bad for me. Yeah. Don't let me live that way. And see, we've seen this, I mean, for the whole of my ministry, and I'm sure yours as well, where people have come in and said, well, you know, do you, we used to get the question, do you have, are you, do you have a traditional worship service or a modern worship service, contemporary worship service? We have both. We have nine o'clock for the, <laughs> for the old geezers. That's right. And then we have that 1030 because the young folks like to wake up later. Well, you know how I started answering that question. I said, yeah, I said, we have, we have both. I said, oh, good. I said, yes. Yeah. You know, it's a, uh, it's traditional traditional because we've been doing it a long time and it's contemporary. We do it every week, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, you, if you don't serve my style, yes. I mean, which is, this is, which the same is, which thing. is so troubling because we've already, it's not like this is a new thing. No. CRTI, no. CRTI is again, this is something that is kind of pasted on right now. Right. Uh, but this goes back to Truman's book. Can't get away from that about the, um, the Rise individual. Self. Yes. I mean, that's that we were already primed up and geared to yeah. accept the kind of statement where a man would say, you know, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. We're already geared up for that because of where we've been. Right. And so, uh, in that sense, it's, as you're, as you're, if you're a Christian, listen to this. If you're a pastor, listen to this. Do connect your uh, rebuke of critical race theory and intersectionality to the broader worldview issues. Begin to understand them. We've tried to spell this out and by what standard, try to spell this out in strong and courageous. A lot of the stuff we're doing, Institute of Public Theology. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, this can't be a particular hobby horse. It is right. a particular touch point right now that yeah. has to be addressed head on. But you need to be building up your theology and your understanding even of philosophy underneath what's going on right now. Amen. Amen. So this is not a hobby for us. This is not something that, you know, oh, we found uh, the the flavor of the day. We're just going to pursue it. No, this has come up because we've been trying to be faithful in biblical ministry and thinking theologically about the world. And that's how we ought to engage these things. The battle has come to us. We didn't go out and pick a fight. Uh, this is the battle. This is, this is the day where God has placed us. So every pastor, every church, every, all Christians, every church leader especially, has to own the stewardship that God himself has placed on us in his wise providence of making us live here and now in these situations. But the truth hasn't changed. The word hasn't changed. The gospel hasn't changed. We have every reason to be full of hope as we carry out our stewardship. Absolutely. So if you find yourself at a upcoming conference, maybe a panel of speakers, maybe a big convention, Maybe, maybe in maybe, Nashville, maybe somewhere in the in heartland, some of the leaders start saying, well, you know, I just think it's a distraction. Shake your head at that and say, no, I don't think it's a distraction. I think that we need to be faithful. We need to watch our life and our doctrine closely. And we need to be faithful shepherds of the flock of God amid a time when there really is a new religion that is on the rise. Amen. Thanks so much for listening to the sword and the trial today. We'll see you next time.